Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Michael Reddington about leading through listening in uncertain times. Michael Reddington, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to have this discussion today. Uh, I was really fascinated as we were doing some of the pre-interview um, preparation and um, some emails back and forth and, and just getting a sense for where we could take the discussion today. Uh, I was intrigued by your background and how it connects with the, the topic of listening and so we're going to be talking about leading through listening in uncertain times today. And I think you will bring a really unique perspective to all of this. Uh, for the listeners, Michael Reddington is a certified forensic interviewer and the president of Inquasive Inc., a company that integrates the key components of effective non-confrontational interview techniques with current business research for executives. Using his background in forensics and his understanding of human behavior through interrogation, Reddington teaches businesses to use the truth to their advantage. Michael received his bachelor's degree in business administration and management from Southern New Hampshire University and received additional education on negotiation and leadership. And for more information, you can visit his company website at inquasive.com. Um, so thank you again, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm excited to have this discussion. And I'm just so curious how you went how you started to make that connection, you know, from interrogation, you know, to how listening can be used um, with executives. Um, so we'll get into that. But first, I want to give you a chance to to share with listeners anything else about yourself, other background information, and then we'll just launch in. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. And again, thank you for having me today. I've been looking forward to it. I would rather really focus on the conversation. So I'll just say briefly that I started in Quasive after creating the disciplined listening method. And I created the disciplined listening method by integrating research from across the spectrum of business communication with the core characteristics and traits of the world's best non-confrontational interview and interrogation techniques from both sides of the Atlantic. And what really, I guess, kicked off the passion for this for me was as I was traveling the world teaching non-confrontational interview and interrogation techniques, I started spending more time with executives that ran the organization than I was with the actual investigators that I was initially called to train. And in those conversations, I made two key realizations. The first is that the very best interviewers and the very best executives capitalize on the same two core skills, vision and influence. And on the flip side, the cognitive process that interrogation suspects experience as they truthfully commit to saying I did it is essentially identical to the cognitive processes that customers experience before committing to say I'll buy it and employees experience before committing to say I'll do it. And in order for us to capitalize on those, we really have to listen. And so much has been said about listening, and I know you do a lot of work in that arena as well, but it's really being patient enough to let the conversation come to us to identify new opportunities to establish unexpected bonds with people and, and being able to tie so many different resources together to really deliver that message is, has been a fantastic experience for me. Well, yeah, that's, that's so interesting. Um, and, and listening is vital. It's, it's so important to being uh, effective in the workplace. Um, and so I'm curious, I mean, you, you just spoke to it a little bit, um, but how, how has being an interrogator, um, what has it taught you about 
being an effective leader and how can leaders better lead by listening? My, I guess solicited, you asked for it. Usually I say my unsolicited opinion, but you asked for it, I appreciate it. My opinion is that interview and interrogation is a white hot microcosm of leadership. Is essentially what happens is you get, I mean, there's, there's different applications, but especially in the world that I come from, you typically get one interviewer in a room with one subject at a time. And there isn't, in, in most situations, there are no, at least initially, there are no real shared interests. There's no real shared opportunities. We have to build rapport from scratch. And coming from the world of non-custodial interviews, we typically have less than an hour to get the information that we need. And the majority of the victims, witness, suspects, and even clients that I spoke with had more motivation to withhold the true story from me than they had to share the true story. So really learning what it takes to find new and unexpected opportunities to connect with people became one of the absolute keys. And we can't do that unless we're truly listening. And there are so many barriers that we put up for ourselves when it comes to listening. For me, the most important part of listening is talking. Because if I'm talking to myself, I can't possibly be listening to everything you're saying and picking up on all the nuances and contextual value of the conversation. So really being able to put aside our expectations of value, to put aside our biases and assumptions and go into every conversation with that learning mentality to allow the truth to take us where we need to go and find a way to connect with people that likely got out of bed that day swearing they would never tell anybody what I need to know. Those lessons and those perspectives and techniques transition directly to conversations that leaders have every day. Yeah, and and I mean, let's be clear, we're not uh, advocating that that a manager pulls the uh, uh, the employee into the office in a dark room with the you know the the stereotypical like interrogation scene right where you got the light shining on their face and you're interrogating them and trying and you know making them sweat that's not what we're talking about and I suspect that that stereotype isn't even accurate um, you know what's portrayed in the media versus what you actually do as an interrogator but that's certainly not what we're suggesting uh, leaders do but it, it's taking the principles of like how to be an effective interrogator and then applying that over into a workplace setting so you can listen with intent. You can fully be there with the person that you're communicating with to understand not just what they're saying verbally, but all the nonverbal cues, all the little uh, subtext and, and other elements that are gonna be really important. And that is huge when I'm trying to better understand my people, I'm trying to understand their motivations, I'm trying to understand what drives them, I'm trying to understand the challenges they're facing, I'm trying to help them, um, maximize their potential and recognize areas for improvement and performance. All of that happens through conversation and it, that will only be enhanced through better active listening. Uh, and unfortunately leaders often, you know, they come in guns blazing. They, they just want to fix stuff. They tell, you know, start barking orders or telling people what to do as opposed to like sitting back, listening, having that meaningful dialogue. And then through that process, you're empowering that person sitting, you know, on the other side of the table from you or in the chair next to you, you're, you're, you're missing the opportunity to help them uh, and empower them to, to work their way through the challenges they're facing, to feel valued, to feel heard, to feel safe, um, to feel um, that you are there for them. You know, you, you miss out on all of that. Um, so I, I think those are some of the, the areas we need to really be focusing on. I couldn't agree more. And first, let me validate your suspicion and thank you for saying it. What makes for wonderful Hollywood drama typically does not work real well in real life. So I think people <laughs> would be surprised if they had witnessed the conversations my former teammates and I had and how so successful. To double down on, on a few points that you made, all too often when leaders go into conversations, they value time over quality because they have such a crunch on their day and they're just, you know, they're facing all these pressures all the time. Typically they look at their calendar and think, well, how can I get into and out of every conversation as quickly as possible? And because they're focused on getting into and out of, they end up taking a path which verifies their expectations, which may be right or wrong, and typically puts people on the defensive because they don't realize that their titles alone 
encourage people to withhold or massage information because as a leader, you're the one who can get me in trouble. So I have to be careful with what I tell you. And on that same thought, generally the number one fear that stops most people from doing most things isn't failure, it's embarrassment. So if we're not listening for those cues and if we're not conscious about how we're engaging in that conversation, we can inadvertently take a parental approach or say something that we thought was okay, but didn't land so well with somebody else. And now they're embarrassed, they're defensive, they're guarded, and we're getting less valuable information to help us achieve our goals. So much of listening is, you know, we said the most important part is talking. It's not just our, in our own head, but also how we approach people and give them that opportunity. I think if the, some of the best advice I ever got, and it took me way too many years to listen to it, was let the conversation come to you. Just be patient and let that conversation unwind. And there is no telling what you can learn and how we can connect. And if leaders can flip that time versus quality focus, their achievements will, will likely reflect that. I love that. Um, and, and I think let, let's, let's pivot a little bit and, and take what we were just talking about and, and apply it to our current context that we're in right now. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, we are, we're dealing with maybe not, it's probably not unprecedented, but certainly heightened levels of, of social unrest, um, geopolitical tensions. We're in, in a, the middle of an election year here in the U S and there's a lot of uh, angst around that black lives matter. Um, you know, all, all of this is happening and is, is framing the context in which organizations are trying to function and to, to lead their people. Um, and really, I think you said it well as we were preparing for the interview, it, it really just comes back to uncertainty, right? Um, so how, how do you take what we've been discussing in relation to listening and leading through listening and apply that? I mean, obviously it's important at any time, but particularly in uncertain times, in, heightened, in times of heightened anxiety, heightened stress, um, how can we leverage listening to better lead people through uncertainty? Great question and so true. Um, what we may be, what we're experiencing right now may not be unprecedented. I feel like it's safe to say the intention and coverage of it is unprecedented just based on the, the technology we currently have available to us, which certainly adds to that, that heightened level and experience for us. So there's two ways for that. And the first is for us. Um, and when it comes to listening, again, I truly believe that so much of listening is an emotional experience because it, as we take in information, we start immediately fitting that within our self-image and our expectations and our previous beliefs. So as the information we receive starts reacting with that, now we start thinking or preparing, are we gonna defend? Are we gonna accept? Are we open? Are we closed? So really for us, one of the first steps is to try to, as much as possible, delay, we probably can't disconnect, but at least delay that emotional facet of listening. And that really starts by understanding the goal of any conversation. If we're able to go into any conversation, not the polite social conversations, but if it's a conversation of substance, we should be able to clarify going into any conversation, how can this conversation get me closer to goals that I need to achieve? And if we can exercise that type of situational awareness and not lose sight of those long-term goals, then we can start doing a better job compartmentalizing these emotions that we start feeling as we take in this new information and really start listening for value instead of opportunities to defend. So that, that would be one thought for us. When it comes to inspiring people to share more, how, the question becomes, how do we empathize during tough situations? How do we empathize with somebody else who is experiencing stress and uncertainty at a level different than us. And one of the challenges that leaders face is generally they'll get the uncertainty first. They'll navigate their way through it. Then they'll go ahead and communicate based on their completed navigation to an audience that's at the first step in that process. And now there's the disconnect because, well, I'm okay with this. Why aren't you okay with this? When in reality, we've known about this for two weeks. They've known about it for two seconds. So, in order to try to help with that, we often ask people to consider, prior to engaging in any conversation of substance, 
to ask themselves not why should someone agree to what I want or commit to what I want, why shouldn't someone agree to what I want or commit to what I want? Because by asking that question, it allows us to truly, at least as close as possible, consider their perspective, consider motivations they may have or fears they may have that run contrary to what we're trying to achieve, and then adapt how we approach them. Because if we can approach them in a way that helps them protect their self-image and doesn't put them on the defensive, then it gives them the opportunity to share the intelligence that we need. Now we compartmentalize our initial emotional response, stay focused on value and goals, and, and we could be off to a whole new series of opportunities that we previously wouldn't have had available. Yeah, I, great, great insights. Um, and I, I completely agree. I think it's it's so important right now uh, amidst this kind of, this heightened level of uncertainty and anxiety for employers to, it's even more important for them to be good listeners, um, to not pass judgment, to not, to not project their own assumptions. And the example you used about, you know, us, if I'm a leader and I, I've known about information, I've already worked through it, and then I spring it on my people and expect them to just get to where I'm at immediately, that's just not how it works. But that that's such a common um, approach, not necessarily a tactic or anything, it's just it's just natural human, it's human nature, you know, that we, mm -hmm. we, we tend to do it that way. So unless we're aware that that's happening and we're, we're able to pause and take a step back and realize, oh wait, they're, they're dealing with the same feelings, emotions, anxieties that I was dealing with two weeks ago, um, maybe even more because they don't benefit from, you know, a leader is in all those meetings. They're in all, they have all the context. And, and yeah. the first time I share something with, with people that are on my team, they, they don't have all the context to, to, uh, to, to understand it in if I haven't communicated at all. And so it could even be worse for them. So I have to be able to be, uh, show compassion and empathy and that can only happen as we listen, um, as we listen with intent to understand, um, not intent to project or to, to, you know, to make assumptions or to fix, but just to understand and to support. Um, and if we can do that, we're going to be in a better position to understand the real challenges that our people are facing to help them to the extent possible that, we're, you know, we're in a position to help and at least at least just to allow them to feel heard um, in their anxiety uh, amidst the uncertainty. E even if we have nothing to offer by way of, um, you know, fixing their problem or empowering them or strengthening them, just the act of listening and helping them to feel heard and validated will be so important to helping them process and move forward. Couldn't agree more. Maybe we'll, maybe sometime during this conversation, we'll get to something we don't agree on, but I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, so often we don't stop to think that people view how we communicate with them as proof for how much we respect them. And that goes with the perceived time we spend, with the volume, speed, tone of voice, words, choice that we use, uh, obviously the nonverbal indicators, all those things. But if we're rushing into or out of a conversation, if we throw our hands up and say, we're not gonna be able to help them, so what's the point? Or if we're annoyed because this is the fifth time in two weeks they've come to us with this, well then clearly we haven't empathized enough to listen to not just what they're saying, but what are they really thinking and feeling and how do we address that? And, and that really becomes the key of allowing, being able to put ourselves deep enough into their shoes where we can start addressing those issues so they do feel like there's been some sort of forward progress and connection. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I'm also curious about your your take on feedback. Um, so one of the roles as leaders that we have is to be able to provide meaningful, timely, substantive feedback to our people so they can, you know, see their potential and then work towards reaching it, right? And mm -hmm. improve, improve their performance. Um, most people can't just magically improve unless they're given good quality feedback. Um, so how do you see listening connecting to our ability to then provide that feedback uh, and how can we do that more effectively? 
inextricably. I mean, oftentimes when we go to give feedback, it's easy for us to think as leaders, well, we've got it all figured out. And just like any client that ever called us for an investigation, if they were to say, I've got it all figured out, well then A, why did you call us? And B, were you there when the crime occurred? Because unless you were, you, you don't have it all figured out. And often as leaders, we fall into the same trap, whether it's based on our experience or our biases or our assumptions, whatever it is, we decide we've got it all figured out. So it's easy to go into these feedback conversations in a confirmation mentality and not in a learning mentality. And if we can engage in that conversation in a way where, again, we allow the conversation to come to us and we start listening for these maybe hidden or obscured fears, motivations, concerns from people, now we can connect with them on the level they really need to. When it comes to feedback, one of the things, and I'll keep it super brief, but one of the approaches that we really work on taking is work towards our, our core point, not start with it. Because people's defenses are typically at the highest at the beginning of the conversation. So if we were to sit down with somebody at the beginning of the conversation and say, you really need to do a better job coaching your people. Let's talk about that. Well, we just picked a fight. Even if they're the worst coach in the world, they don't think that. So now we just created conflict. But if we allow them, if we allow them to share excuses and we capitalize on them, this is like inverse thought processing for so many leaders. If we allow somebody to talk about how busy they are and how they're pulled in so many different directions and we let them run with that and then we say, yeah, we do have all those things going on, especially in a pandemic with everybody virtual and all these new challenges. So with that, let me ask you this. How many hours in the last month would you say you've worked on coaching your people? So we lead our way to it and we use the excuse. So that way he's not confronted with it. We work our way to it. And then when he says, well, probably about maybe three, we know the answer is one or less. But instead of confronting him and saying that's not true, by him saying maybe probably about three, we now know that he knows that it's not enough. So he gets the message and now we can talk about prioritization and the effect and the impact and we can create commitments for what this will look like next month, all in a way that allows them to protect their self image. So as leaders, giving feedback should not be about, I am expert, hear me roar. It should be about connecting with people in a way that allows them to, to embrace that idea ownership for the commitment at the end because they don't feel like they were confronted along the way unnecessarily. Sometimes people need that confrontation, don't get me wrong. But at least at the beginning of the process, it causes more harm than problems it solves. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to get someone defensive and putting up walls because then then at that point, the discussion really doesn't go anywhere. Um, and so you're absolutely right. There are times where confrontation needs to happen and that can happen in a skilled manner. But if you go in guns blazing, you know, you're shutting things down before you even get started. Um, 100%. And, and, you know, managers, leaders, they have to deal with those types of difficult conversations all the time. And what I've observed is that most leaders don't know how to do it well because um, they're not good listeners. Um, and, and then they, they do, they try to puff out their chest or, you know, put, you know, put out their, their feathers like a peacock and, and show their strengths, show their power, show their um, authority, uh, rather than trying to have a meaningful connection with the person, you know, sitting next to them. And, and then they don't really listen and, and then they just say things that get the person defensive. And so rather than having a, mean, a meaningful conversation that will allow them to get to the nitty gritty of what, you know, needs to be addressed, um, they never even get there. And so a lot of leaders don't know how to do it. They're not skilled, but a lot of leaders also just aren't comfortable. They, they just, because they know they're not skilled at it, they also, they just try to avoid those conversations. And so they don't give feedback. It, it's not even a matter of giving effective or meaningful feedback. It's like they just don't even give any um, because they actively try to avoid those types of situations. Um, I, I think it also comes back to taking um, taking the, the, the pressure off uh, of these conversations by just making them normal. Make it part of the culture uh, that you're going to have a mentoring and coaching culture that everyone expects 
that you as the boss, but everyone, like everyone helps everyone. Um, and if you see someone struggling, you're expected to step in and help them and have a conversation and, and help them figure something out. As a leader, you're expected to have regular conversations and it doesn't need to wait until like a six month or a year end um, performance appraisal, right? But it can happen weekly through just you being connected with your people. If, 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 or if leaders can do that, it takes the pressure off. Um, of trying to say everything perfectly and and our people don't expect us to be perfect they know that we're gonna say dumb things and put our foot in our mouth sometime but if we start to build that relationship and they know we're putting our best foot forward they know we're trying um, they know we're trying to show compassion and empathy and that we're trying to understand that will go a really long way into having those types of meaningful discussions again a hundred percent on board um, Oftentimes when we look at our to-do list, the thing we want to do the absolute least is the thing that's most important. And it probably gets bumped onto a couple of different lists along the way and feedback conversations are that for a lot of people. And so what they end up doing is avoiding it until they can't. So if you need to give me feedback, or I'm sorry, I need to give you feedback. Literally one day you're walking by my office. I'm like, oh, hey, come in here for a minute, Jonathan. I've only got three minutes. Well, as soon as I say I've only got three minutes, I've told you that you're not worth four minutes of my life. And now I'm just trying to rush to get this crossed off my list instead of having the actual impact. Managers are rightfully often afraid of being micromanagers and people rightfully don't like being micromanaged. So leaders will avoid these conversations because they don't want to micromanage people. But then what happens is they become passive aggressive micromanagers. I ignore you for three months, then I micromanage the hell out of you for a week and a half, and then I ignore you for three months again, which is even worse for their employees. To your point, if they make it a routine, now it's not micromanagement, it's a routine. And it becomes easier for them because they get more experience with it, less pressure on their people because it's just part of the routine. And it's, it's micromanagement when we focus on the person. Jonathan, what you need to do, what you need to improve on, what you're missing, what you didn't hear, what you're not, that's micromanagement. But if we look at the scope of a project, or if we look at the scope of somebody's responsibilities, and we make a three month plan, knowing it's gonna change when new things come up, but now every week we're reviewing the plan, now it's not micromanagement, it's process updates. And we can collaborate on that. And it's, it's a whole different experience for everybody involved. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, Michael, it has been a real uh, pleasure. It's been a lot of fun talking with you today. We're about out of time. Um, but before we part ways uh, for this discussion, and, and perhaps I could have you on again sometime because we only scratched the surface and there's a lot more that we could go into. Uh, but before we part ways today, I wanna give you the last word and I wanna give you a chance to share with the listeners how they can get connected with you, how they can find out more about your business and uh, perhaps reach out if they need assistance. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, to learn more about the seminars and advisory sessions we do on applying strategic ethical persuasion skills for sales, human resources, leadership, executive conversations, they can find us at inquasive.com, I-N-Q-U-A-S-I-V-E.com. If they're looking for me on social media, you can find me on LinkedIn at Michael Reddington CFI. I've been begrudgingly dragged onto Twitter, but LinkedIn is, is really where they can find me. Um, and my email is mreddington at inquasive.com as well. So I would be more than happy to answer any questions and connect with anyone who's enjoyed this conversation. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Michael. It really has been a pleasure. I encourage my listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Michael can do to do, to do for you. And I hope everyone will take to heart what we've talked about today in terms of just thinking about how we can pause, be more intentional, uh, more considerate, uh, more present listeners as we're in conversations with those in our lives, whether that be in the workplace or at home or with friends, family, whatever. Um, it, it will make for more meaningful relationships. As leaders, it will help us lead more effectively. I hope everyone will stay healthy and safe. I hope everyone can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day, and I hope everyone has a great week. Thank you. We are excited to announce the launch of Human Capital Innovation's new e-magazine, 
Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. We hope you'll check out our first issue and please let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.